Greetings to all of you that have joined our meeting. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Opening the word of truth to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning from verse 13 through 20. Hebrews 2, uh, 6, 13 through 20. The author writes, From when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear, swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given, as confirmation is, the, is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath in order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge in having hold of the hope said before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And bow your heads with me as I ask God to bless our time together. Father God, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for those that have logged in from all over. And Father, we are so excited because we know you have something to teach us this evening. We pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will enlighten us as we study. May he teach us. May he open our eyes to your truth that we may come to understand how we can better live our lives in a manner that will glorify you. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Again, thank you for those of you who tuned in, especially those who have forgotten their sleep. You don't know what it means. I see people from Nigeria, and right now in Nigeria is exactly after one in the morning. And yet people still desire to participate in the teaching of his word. And that will be a judgment to those who have no reason, not even uh, midnight yet in America. God's unfailing promises. That's the topic we have this hour. God's unfailing promises. We've come to the end of this chapter before the author begins. The, the author, you, you see when we, in verse 20, it says where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The author touches on Melchizedek again. Remember in chapter five, he touched it. He couldn't go ahead. He couldn't even uh, uh, make any statement about Melchizedek. The reason being that the people to whom he was addressing were not growing in Christ. They were babies. And so they didn't have the capacity or the frame of reference to be able to relate to the teaching regarding Melchizedek. And so he dropped it in chapter five. In chapter six, just as the, he was about to drop his pen, he mentions it again. And then finally in chapter seven, he's going to go full gear. 
uh, there is no he, he realizes that he can't keep dropping this name Mekizadek without going in full force to explain what he meant by Mekizadek. So the author's objective in this section is fourfold. The author's objective in this section, this last section is fourfold. A, to draw his audience attention to God's immutable nature. To draw his audience attention to God's immutable nature. B, to encourage them to persevere and not give up. To encourage them to persevere and not give up. C, to highlight God's two immutable things. To highlight God's two immutable things. And D, to underscore the importance of faith, hope, and patience in the plan of God. Again, to underscore the importance of faith, hope, and patience in the plan of God. So we begin with the first one in our, in this fourfold. A, God's immutable nature. We just want to look at this God that we are dealing with, his immutable nature. Who is he? You cannot worship that which you don't know. And which is many people, what many people do today. Even Jesus Christ told the woman, the Samaritan woman, you people worship that which you don't know. And Paul himself castigates the, the Jewish community that they worship, but they worship without knowledge. They lack knowledge in their worship. Everybody can worship, but not everybody has the knowledge regarding the God that we worship. And so the author seeks to underscore, to make sure that they understand the immutable nature of this God that we have come to believe. And who is he? One, God is internal. God is internal. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Psalm 102, verse 25 and 27. Turn with me to Psalm 102, verse 25 through 27. Talks about the internality of God. Of old thou didst found the earth. And the heavens are the work of thy hands. Even they will perish, but thou dost endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing, thou will change them and they will be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. You are the same. That means internality of God doesn't change. He's the same. When other things around us may change, but God remains the same. Number two, point two. God's nature is unchangeable. God's nature is unchangeable. Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6. God, God's nature is unchangeable. He's the same. He cannot change. When we talk about God's nature, we're talking about everything that has to do with God. Everything that has to do with God doesn't change. He doesn't change. All his attributes, they do not change. God has uh, at least, we can list 10 attributes of God. None of those attributes is subject to change. Uh, God is love. 
God can never stop being loved. That is who he is. God doesn't learn to be to love people he, he, like we do. You and I will learn to love. But God doesn't learn to love because that's who he is. First John 4, 8. God is love. Take away love, you have no God. And that is the agape love. That is his person. That's why God will always love you no matter how you are. No matter, even when you fail, he still loves you. Because he cannot change his attribute. Just because you failed, he cannot swing. God's love is not, does not swing like a pendulum. I hate, I love, I hate, I love, I hate. When you hear the word hate applied to God, it's just a language of accommodation to help us understand God's policy. But he doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6 says he doesn't change. Number three, there is no past, present, and future with God. There is no past, present, and future with God. We are the people that entertain past, we entertain present, we entertain future, not with God, because he has no beginning, and so there is no past with him. He has no ending, so there is no future with him. Past, present, and future are terms used for, for us alone. Number four, and this is important, God's holiness, God's holiness ensures purity in all he says and does. God's holiness ensures purity in all he says and does. What does that mean? His holiness guarantees that if he makes a promise, he must keep it. His holiness guarantees that whatever he does must be, must reflect holiness. If God deals with us, his dealing with us must reflect his holy character. Again, God's holiness ensures purity in all he says and does. Regarding God's internality, I like what Charles Ryrie, one of the, uh, one of a great, a great scholar, Charles Ryrie, who passed away, uh, I think, uh, a couple of years ago. I, I had the opportunity of uh, speaking with him uh, a few times when he read my book on uh, spiritual life. So we conversed a few times before he went to be with the Lord. This is what he wrote concerning God's internality. Quote, the attribute of eternity means that God exists endlessly. His existence extends endlessly backward and forward. Wow. Without any interruption or limitation caused by succession of events. Let me say it again as I quote him. The attribute of eternity means that God exists endlessly. He has no beginning. His existence extends endlessly backward and forward without any interruption or limitation caused by succession of events. In other words, just try to take this small mind of us. Look backward, as far as you can go backward. That's where you can find God. But the point is that you keep piercing into backward. The backward is eternity past. All the way, you can never reach the endless of God's existence. It's mind-boggling, is not? It is. This brings us to the second of this fourfold teaching that the author seeks to bring to the church, to his audience in Hebrews chapter six. B, encouragement and perseverance. Encouragement and perseverance. 
and that takes us to a verse 18, Hebrews 6, 18. In order that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong, I like that, strong encouragement. Not just encouragement, but strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. We have, we have, we have fled and we have anchored our hope in what is said before us. Well, encouragement is important. We cannot say this enough. Encouragement is important. Every believer needs encouragement. Why? In discouragement is one of the greatest weapons Satan uses against Christians, against believers. And you, those of you who have ever experienced discouragement, you know what I'm talking about. When you are discouraged, it's difficult to pray. When you are discouraged, it's difficult to even read your Bible. When you are truly discouraged, it's even difficult to get out of your bed. And sometimes from discouragement, you swing to depression. And from depression, you go even deeper into life that doesn't just reflect who you are. It starts with discouragement. And the devil throws things at us that will cause us to, dis to be discouraged. Many a battle is lost because of discouragement. I I'm sure those of you who have watched uh, uh, games, football, be it uh, African, European football or American football, it doesn't matter. All those professional games, if you have watched, uh, I, 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 I used to watch basketball and that was long ago when uh, <laughs> a Nigerian was playing. Uh, I was surprised when I came to America and saw, saw a person playing and they told me he came from uh, Nigeria. And I said, wow, well, let me watch him. And that's when I started watching. He, he kind of poked my interest. But in watching these games, not that I, I didn't, I wasn't uh, sucked into, I normally watch their last games when they are in uh, championship kind of. I have seen them. I have watched these people come from behind. I'm talking about uh, they so at one point they were as down they were down by 30 points. That is the rocket who's in who's in rockets. They were down by 30 points, third quarter. You you, you can say that you can look at them and say this game is over. You can see people already celebrating because how can you wipe out this deficit? And suddenly 30 points become becomes 20 points, 15 points, 12 points, 10, 8 points, deficit is 6, 2 is a tie. And you see everybody spinning their heads. You see the opponent spinning their heads. You wonder what, what actually happened? What actually happened? What suddenly these people got revived? Maybe somebody in the locker room, maybe the coach, or somebody ha may have gotten up and said, guys, we can do this. We know we are down by 30 points, but we are equal. We have the capacity, we have the uh, ability. And perhaps somebody charged them up and they moved and displayed. They were encouraged. Encouragement is so powerful. Let us not overlook the words of encouragement. We are commanded to do so in Hebrews 3, verse 13. He said, encourage one another. Don't say, well, even pastors need encouragement. Ministers need encouragement because they are on the war front. They are in the forefront of the battlefield. They, they get hit. They, they receive more bullets than those in the pew. So they need a word of encouragement. And encouragement comes in various ways. 
it, it can come by way of just sending few lines. It can come by way of maybe gifts. It can come any way. You find that what your brother or sister is going through, it comes to that person's aid. That's tremendous encouragement. And so encouragement and perseverance. The author encourages them, knowing the source of their encouragement, that it comes through the word of God. It comes, the true encouragement that we have is that which the word of God produces. Turn to Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Romans 15, Paul speaks, of, speaks on the issue of encouragement. In verse 4, Paul says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. There you have it. The entire Bible was written for you, for, for your instruction, for my instruction, Paul tells us. That through perseverance, you see that word? That through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You see how Paul knitted this together. Encouragement, perseverance, and hope. They are all knitted together and love some for us. The author of Hebrews does the same thing here. He, he encourages them and that is his audience. Encouragement and perseverance. One, the author encourages his audience to stay the course. The author encourages his audience to stay the course. You and I cannot afford, you cannot afford to abandon this race. It's costly to walk away. It's costly to just say, well, I, I'm, I'm not interested in the race anymore. Hebrews 10, 35. Hebrews 10, 35 tells us, therefore do not throw away, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. That's what the Bible is telling us. Don't throw away your confidence. It has a great reward. As where God tells us the same book, if you Abandon your confidence. God said, if you shrink, God said, I will have no pleasure with you. This is serious. This isn't just, this is, this is not, a, a, this is not, this is a real game. We have been drafted. This is, we're not, this is not a kind of a, uh, Let's see how it works. We are already in action. We are already in action. And God is watching us. The angels are watching you to see how you will live this life. Again, the author encourages his audience to stay the course. Stay the course. The same thing I'm telling you this evening. I know sometimes you feel like abandoning the whole thing. No, stay the course. For you, if you abandon, you lose everything. We don't know. We don't know what they. What, what we don't know what God is pre preparing for those who love Him, as Paul tells us. We don't know. We don't know the nature. We don't know the nature of eternity. None of us here knows what will happen tomorrow when Christ returns. We have no clue. But one thing I do know is that we have 
many warnings in the Bible about losing out as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. One of, one of these warnings is found in 1 John. 1 John, Paul writing to, to his audience in 1 John, he warns them about the consequences of losing out as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 1 John 2, 28. The author tells them, or John himself tells them, and now little children, abide in him. In other words, keep on maintaining fellowship with Jesus Christ so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. He's talking to believers. It's not talking, about, it's not talking to unbelievers. The, this epistle was written to believers. And that's why he calls them my children. And so he's telling, to, he's telling them my children, there is, there is a possibility that when Christ returns, you will be ashamed of yourself. I don't know what kind of shame that believers who fail Christ will entertain. I have no clue. But if, if whatever shame they will entertain, you can well call it a righteous shame. I call it myself a righteous shame. It's not a sinful shame, the righteous one. In other words, you, you will actually know that you have failed God. You will actually know that you have missed, you are missing something in life. You will actually know that you are short of something in eternity. You will know. That's the only way you can experience shame. But why? Why wait to experience shame for eternity? Why? I just can't comprehend. What is more important to us as believers than running this race and winning it, winning it with all our accuracy? Paul himself was so concerned about running this race and not winning. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, he echoes the danger of not winning the race. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize, only one. It doesn't mean that only one person will receive the prize. He's just trying to describe a winner from a loser. And then he says, run in such a way that you may win. That's, a, that's, a, that's not a joke. Run in such a way that you may win. That means there's a way you can run and not win. It's not a matter of covering distance. It's a matter of running and covering distance according to the rules. You see, somebody can run 100 meters and break the world's record. I mean, break the world record by 10 times. But if the person runs out of bound, even though he has broken the world record, the individual is disqualified. Not because he didn't maintain speed. He did. He broke the world record by 10 times. But yet he didn't receive any reward. Why? He just stepped out of line, out of bound. I suppose they run in such a way that you may win. In verse 25, and everyone who competes in the games, exercise self-control in all things. That is the key. Self-control. Discipline. Self-control in all things. They did it to receive a perishable wrath. But we, we are imperishable. Self-control. When people run in a race, you see them. Imagine these young athletes. Some of them 12, 13, 14 years who compete in Olympics. The, the tremendous pressure that is laid on them, exercising seven hours, eight hours a day, constantly avoiding things that will make them, will not give them the energy. Cutting, maybe cutting this fat, cutting this, they, even they, like, they, they, may, they may like chocolate. And the coach will say, chocolate this time, or these three months, cut it off. And that's what it means, self-control. They see chocolate in front of them, they just pass it by. Why? Save control. They have their eyes on winning 
the race. They have their eyes on winning the race. Paul says, they do it to receive a perishable wrath. You see, in Roman time, when they win, they, they're going to place a wreath over them as an honor. But it, that honor comes with prize, with privileges. And so in verse 25, Paul says, verse 26, rather, Paul says, we do it in 25. We, we do our own to receive imperishable. Verse 26, this is where Paul zooms in. He's not talking about himself. Therefore, I, Paul, run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not between the air. Do you run that way as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you beating the air? Do you have objective? Let me ask you this question tonight. Do you have objective in your spiritual race as you are running? Are you running in such a way that you win or you don't care? Let me tell you, let me, let me be frank to you, with you. I don't like to be around Christians who don't care about internal state, period. I don't even like to talk to them. I, I pray for them in my private prayer. I don't like to associate with believers that are here. I don't care. I just want to get to heaven. If I hear such thing around, people that are around me, I will stay away from such people. In other words, you are telling me you have no regard for the penalty that Jesus paid on the cross. It doesn't concern you. The horror that Jesus went on the cross has no concern to you. All you just want to go into heaven and rest. I cause such people as, I cause such people users. They, they are users of heaven. Users. In fact, they are for such people because they are, they are people users. The same way they are trying to use Jesus to get to heaven, they'll use you whenever you are around. They are users. All they think about is themselves. They have no thought about God and the price, the cost that Jesus Christ went through on the cross. The horror, the painful death doesn't mean anything to them. I don't know what heaven holds for people who, who fail, but what I, what I do know is the warning that is all over scattered in the Bible. Paul warns us that a person who fails will arrive in heaven as one who arrived through fire. I don't know what that means. The Bible didn't tell us. The Holy Spirit didn't tell us. But it's not important that he tells you. What is important is that he, you have been warned. Verse 26 again, Paul says, Therefore I run in such a way as not with that aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. 27, but I buffet my body and make it my slave. Lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. When you read the whole of chapter 9, you see where Paul was coming from. In chapter 9, Paul tells them, Paul said, I have the right to use my authority. But I, I negate using my authority for the sake of winning, Christ, winning people for Christ. I have the right of taking this. I have the right to be paid on salary. I have the right. Jesus told us to be on salary. But I refused. Paul is telling them. In other words, he was very concerned. Paul is not saying that taking salary is, is sinful. Not at all. But Paul was mindful of what he did with those around him. He didn't want them to ever say, well, Paul, you are just in the ministry to make money. He was so careful. In, in fact, in verse 15, Paul, Paul says to them, but I have used none of these things and I'm not writing these things that it may be done. So in my case, for it would be better for me to die than have any man make boast, make my boast an empty one. I would rather die of starvation than have people ridicule the gospel that I preach. Encouragement is so important. We must encourage people to persevere. Don't give up, my brother. Don't give up, my sister. Day in and day out. Paul encourages us that we are closer than when we first began. Eternity is closer 
than when you first believe in Christ. It's closer than you may realize. Some of us is only, some of us it could be one week, one month, two, two years ahead, and we're gone. You see, either it, Jesus comes or we go first. Whichever happens, we are face to face with eternity. Number two, perseverance. Perseverance is the key to winning a race. Perseverance is the key to winning a race. Perseverance. You persevere in a race. Have you ever seen these people who run marathon or, or people who run a uh, relay? Maybe 800, whatever, 400 meters. When you see them running the last lap, that, that brings them to the, to, the, to the winning line. And they are shooting for first position for gold. Watch them. You see them sticking out their tongues, their muscles popping up, their legs going stretched out. They try to have, their, they wish their legs would grow longer than they, what they have. They stretch it as fast as they can go. They stretch their hands. They move. You see their eyeballs rolling back and forth. That's what you call perseverance. They are tired. But they are looking. They have their eyes set on gold. My brother and my sister, have your eyes set on winning that gold that God has set before you. Perseverance is the key to winning a race. Number three. The reward of perseverance is too enormous to let go. The reward of perseverance is too enormous to let go. Four, his audience should imitate heroes of faith, especially Abraham. His audience should imitate heroes of faith, especially Abraham. The author picks on Abraham. He uses the word Abraham more than any other person in the New, in the New Testament except Luke. He mentions Abraham several times in his writing more than any other writer of the New Testament. He uses Abraham because Abraham was a man of faith. So he, so he he wants his audience to focus on this man. If you have a man in the Bible to pick as a hero, he's telling them, pick up Abraham and focus on him. Imitate him. Not just looking at him and studying about Abraham and knowing how beautiful Abraham is. No, rather, what he wants is for the believer to focus on one thing. Focus on this man. Focus on his character his lifestyle, his, how he walked with God, his faith, his hope, his perseverance, his confidence that God will perfect, perfect what he said he will perfect. So that's what he, the audience brings Abraham in this picture. Look at verse 12 that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who does he have in mind in verse 13? For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. He brought Abraham in the picture. We know the story of Abraham, a man of faith, a hero of faith. He started with nothing. God called him out of all the Chaldea. And he just left everything. He left his life in the land. He left his family. He left everything behind and went to an unknown place. The impossibility, walking with God. God didn't give him any map. No GPS. He didn't give him, when we, when we got here, we're going to spend one year here and then I'm, I'm going to move to another level. We spend three years and in the next five years, we go to the promised land. No. He just get out and he obeyed. Walking by faith, not by sight. Trusting God, the invisible one. Trusting one whom he has not even seen or touched. Just a voice. 
that led him to a place of prosperity. That's what the author is trying to get them here, to focus on such a man, a man of faith. And this brings us to the thought of the fourfold fold of the author's objective C. Now we come to the two immutable things. The two immutable things, verses 16 through 18. Hebrews 6, 16 through 18. For then, for men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath, given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. Pay attention to that. An oath, once it's given, matter is settled. Verse 17. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement, we who have fled to refuge for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us. You see, God has given us two things to build our faith on. God has given us two things to build our faith on. The first thing, one, his immutable promises. His immutable promises. God's promises are yea and amen. It's a yes and amen. God's promises are yes and amen. First Corinthians 1.20, they cannot fail. God's promises are solid as God himself is solid. Solid as rock. Two, God has given us his immutable oath. God has given us his immutable oath. Immutable oath. Oath. An oath settles every matter. An oath settles every matter. You, you may not understand. Why do people swear today? Even Jesus told us not to do that anymore. That was in the Old Testament. Jesus said, don't swear anymore. Don't swear with heaven. Don't swear with... Jesus told us in the, on the teaching on the mount. He said, don't, no more swearing. No more taking oath. But some Christians still do it today. We should, we should stop that. I swear. I swear I never did that. Jesus said, don't do that. Anytime you swear, just remember, you are going against Christ. Again, in the Old Testament, an oath brings a matter to, the, to an end. That's why Peter, <laughs> this is interesting. This is amazing too. That's why Peter, the Apostle Peter, used an oath, even though he was lying. You know the story of Peter, don't you? When, they, when Peter was trying to deny Jesus Christ, turn to Matthew chapter, Matthew 26. Peter lied under oath. It was the grace of God, he didn't die. Verse 72. Matthew 26, 72 through 74. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, the by, bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you two are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Listen to him, verse 74. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man, and immediately a cock crowed. Isn't it amazing? Let, let me... Let me let me make let me get this thing. Let me make it even more 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 exciting. It's exciting already. In the Old Testament, assuming a, 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 a wife, a woman commits adultery, and the husband suspects is suspicious of adultery, do you know how they settle it? <laughs> you may surprise you how they settle it. Numbers chapter 5. See, everything is in the Bible. 
If you look so deep, you find everything in the Bible. What they would do, in fact, that's what God told them to do. It's a command. What they would do, they, they would bring the woman, the husband would bring the woman before a priest, and they would offer offering. From verse 11 through 13, you can write it down. And from verse 18 through 22 and 24. This is what they do. They will offer offering, and the, the, the priest will take the offering and put a holy water, and put the offering in the holy water, and sprinkle it in the holy water, and the woman is going to take an oath. Did you do it, or you didn't do it? And the woman will say, nope, I have never been outside the house. I never saw any man. And then go ahead and drink your wine, drink your mixture. If she did it and drinks that, her belly will swell. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Turn to Numbers chapter 5. I, I, I'm sure in, in verse 11, then the Lord said, spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, if any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse, with her and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and she is undetected although she has defied herself and there is no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act. If a spirit of jealousy comes up over him and he is jealous of his wife when she has defied herself or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous over his wife when she has not defile herself. See, two things here. The only thing, if the woman is telling the truth, nothing will happen to her. Verse 18, just keep, I don't have time to read, keep reading. Verse 18, the priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head go loose and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And in the hand of the priest is to, the, is, to the, is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse. Skip. Skip to verse 22. And this water that brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh waste away. And the woman shall say, Amen. Amen. You better be saying the right amen because you'll be dead. You got it? That's, that's about taking an oath. Swearing is something that even in the Old Testament that's, that was taken very seriously. And this is important. As, as the author of Hebrew is telling us, God doesn't have to take an oath. God doesn't have to take an oath. But he did with Abraham. He did with, an, with Abraham. He doesn't. And when he, the author of, uh, of the place we read, when God took an oath, he was not taking an oath. He took an oath not with heaven, not with earth. Because heaven will pass away, earth will pass away. Then his oath will pass away. Rather, he took an oath with himself, the immutable being, the immutable God. God cannot pass away. So the oath he took with himself guarantees that the promise he made to Abraham is as sure as his existence is assured. And that's what the author is saying. You should have confidence in these two things, the promises of God are unbreakable. They, 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 are, they cannot be broken. And his oath that he has taken confirms that what God has made, the promises he has made to us, will come to pass. So as believers, we can rest assured that God's promises cannot go unfulfilled. God does not count in years. Peter tells us that a thousand years are just like one day with God when they come to pass. One thousand years. Imagine a thousand years when, when it
passes by. For us, we keep, we're talking about a thousand years. I mean, the first year will be to 1,000 years. 100 years, we're already scratching our heads. If you live to be 100, whoa. And then you talk about multiply that by 10. That's 1,000. When it comes to pass, it's like one day with God. And so again, we come to uh, Abraham again, consider him. God made him great. See, God made Abraham great. We ask, what exactly made Abraham? What's behind his greatness? Anybody? I, I hope you said faith. It wasn't his. It wasn't uh, his wealth. It wasn't his knowledge. It wasn't what made Abraham one of the uh, uh, epicenter of uh, of religion of whether it's Jewish religion or Christian religion. See, Abraham was in the middle of two religious crowd, Judaism and Christianity. What sandwiched him? A man of faith. Abraham was a man of faith. You see, God, God is not interested in all you do, clapping hands, jumping up and down. God is interested in your faith. Do you have faith? Can you believe even when things are against you? That's what God is looking at. Romans chapter 4, verses 18. Romans 4, 18 through 21. In hope against hope. He, Abraham, believed in order that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in an unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was already giving glory when these things have not yet happened. That's a man of faith. Verse 21, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able to perform. What God has promised, he was able to perform. That alone earned Abraham a title, a friend of God. Do you want to be a friend of God? Have the faith of Abraham. Do you want to be a friend of God? Definitely have the faith of Abraham. Develop such faith that no matter. See, God is, God, God is pleased. Romans 11, Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, you can't please God. And God is a rewarder of those who believe that he exists. Faith is the key. Faith. You see, it says in verse 18, in hope against hope. The, the condition was, wasn't something inviting and exciting. Yet Abraham believed that God will fulfill the promise he has paid. This brings us to D. D, faith. D, brings us to the last installment. Faith, hope, and patience. Faith, hope, and patience. We begin with the first one, faith. A, under one, A, faith is the highway of super abundant of blessing with God. I say that again. Faith is the highway of super abundant blessing with God. God rewards those who have faith. If you want to have special blessing with God, develop faith. Demonstrate that faith. Israel has missed the, the promised land because of faith, unbelief, as we learn in Hebrews 3 and 4. They missed the blessings of the promised land because of unbelief. And the author of Hebrews warned you, you can miss it too if you fail to apply faith. Trust God. 
even when it doesn't look right to trust him. Trust him. He cannot fail. That's his character. B, faith believes in the fulfillment of God's promises, no matter what. I say it again. Faith believes in the fulfillment of God's promises, no matter what. That brings us to the second point, the second element, hope. Two, hope. The author calls hope the anchor of our souls. The author calls hope in our passage the anchor of our souls. And we know that a ship that is firmly anchored is safe from drifting. See, when you have a ship, this big ship, when they are firmly anchored, they cannot drift. Similarly, or likewise, when hope securely anchors, the hope securely anchors our souls, we cannot drift. You see, when hope securely anchors our souls, we cannot drift. See, this hope is like an anchor. The author tells us. It reaches to your soul and holds it so that your soul does not drift. Under this A, hope is a stabilizing force. Hope is a stabilizing force for every believer in Christ. Hope is a stabilizing force for every believer in Christ. In other words, in this hope, you are stabilized. See, when you have hope, when you have hope, you can keep on going even when you are exhausted. If you have hope, you can keep pushing when you don't have any reason to push, when it doesn't appear to be making strength, a strength, you just keep, because you have hope. Jesus had hope. It is because of the hope. Look at Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endures the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He got his eyes fixed on the crowd. And so, because of that hope, Jesus was able to endure every insult. He was able to endure every pain and agony, knowing that all these things will come to pass. And then he will reach out and grab the crown of joy. So as believers, we should and we must hang on to hope. Don't let hope go. If hope goes, we have nothing. See, hope to be, rather be, hope looks forward to the day of fulfillment of God's promises. Hope looks forward to the day of fulfillment of God's promises. You see, what, is, what hope does is that you're looking forward, like Abraham, that one day this promise that God made, he will fulfill it. As you secure your soul with the anchor of hope, it shatters you from outside pressure. Satan tries to knock you down. Satan tries to destroy you. But that hope, that internal hope that you have within you keeps you from outside pressure, outside pressure or circumstances. You see, pressure, you see, stress is always optional. You can choose to be stressful or stressed out. You can choose. But you cannot choose. You have no control over outside pressure. You have no control over coronavirus. coronavirus. You have no control over 
uh, famine in the land. You have no control over what is happening around you. You have no control, but you have control over what happens in your soul. You have control. Uh, my my late cousin, my late uncle, he, he used to say that you cannot stop a bird or birds from flying over your head. You see you know, this band of birds flying and singing in the sky. You can't stop them. Say, don't go this way. I want you to go that side. That's a joke. You can't. But there's one thing you can do. You can stop them from patching on your own head. If a bird comes to patch on your head, you say, not on my head. Get out. That's all you can do. But flying over your head, you cannot stop them. But you can stop them from punching on your own head. That goes with outside pressure and inner pressure. Inner pressure is what you do to yourself. Outside pressure is what circumstances bring upon us. We are sandwiched. We are right now. We don't know what tomorrow holds. It doesn't look too good. Country is closed. I mean, if you tell me that, Moses, you will be locked up and not travel for a year, going on two years, I'll say you are, are you kidding me? You are joking. But it has happened. And we don't even know what happens tomorrow. We see that uh, in Uganda, they are uh, on lockdown. One of our associates that went to Uganda to minister from Kenya has been there for months. They can't even let him go or leave the state because he has been, everybody has been closed. You can't even go from one community to another community. It's not too good. This is what you call asset pressure. But as a believer, you have a choice to make this, to let this pressure become inner tumor or just have hope that God is in control. God knows what he's doing. Daniel said that those who know their God will work strong and do great exploit. If you know God, you don't worry, you don't worry about tomorrow because you know that he has tomorrow under control. You don't care about anything. You don't care about death. If death comes, that's a promotion face to face with the Lord in a place of no more sorrow, no more pain. You're a believer at ease. Relaxing, living your life moment by moment, trusting him who is able. My friend, that's what you call hope. You hope in God, even though it doesn't look too good. You know that circumstances do not determine the future. God determines the future. Your circumstance, let me put it point blank. Your circumstance does not define your future. God defines your future. Your, your circumstance right now can be blamed so bad and people can write you off and God tomorrow can turn that circumstance into a sensational ending. That's my God. That is the one that I preach about. Have hope in him. Have confidence. He cannot fail. Romans chapter 5 as I'm rushing to end this lesson this evening if you ask me, I can, I can talk to you until morning. But the point is that people who have called from overseas will be awake and you will just be going to bed after maybe two or three more hours. Romans 5, Paul tells us beginning from verse 3, and not only this, but we also exhort in our tribulations. In our tribulation, we exhort. Why? Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. See that word again? And perseverance, proven character. You see, without tribulation, you cannot be strengthened. God uses suffering to strengthen believers and bring you to a place of maturity, whereby he can give you blessings untold. You see, without capacity, blessing becomes distraction. Without capacity, Blessing becomes a distraction. It can, it can, blessing without capacity can destroy you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He has destroyed many people. There are people who have been blessed and you don't see them again in, around the church anymore. They are on vacation, one vacation from one vacation because they have the money. And perseverance, proving character, and proving character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That again tells you that once you are born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. You don't have to pray for it. You don't have to pray for Holy Spirit. The moment you are born, verse 5 tells you, which has been given to you, is, is a given. The moment you believe in Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul says in chapter 8, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. Finally, patience. Habakkuk 2.3. Habakkuk 2.3 says, wait upon the Lord, though he tarries. Wait upon the Lord, even if he delays. Wait upon him. Under this we have, you see, the cost, the cost of impatience, you see, is huge. You know that? The cost of impatience is huge. It's costly. Impatience costs much. Look at Saul. Someone told Saul, I'll be coming to do, uh, offer sacrifice before you enter into war. Saul waited for seven days. That's what someone told him. I'll be there on the seventh day. But he didn't show up. And Saul was, his patient exhausted. He became impatient. The moment he was putting together the offering of sacrifice that only was restricted to priests. And Paul was a king. He was putting it together, putting the animal. Samuel showed up. Saul lost his kingdom because of impatience. Under this A, patience waits on God, knowing that God knows what he's doing, even when he delays. Again, for those of you who are writing fast, very good. And if you need to get the, if you need to go back online and listen to, to it over, Thank God they are recorded and they are online. Again, patience waits on God, knowing that God knows what he is doing, even when he delays. B, patience keeps faith and hope in check. Patience keeps hope. I'm sorry, patience keeps faith and hope in check. And finally, see, without patience, faith and hope will fail. Quickly, as we close, let's put down these five points of truth. Quickly, one, God is completely reliable. God is completely reliable. Two, God promises, God fulfills. God promises, God fulfills. Three, God cannot go back on his promises. God cannot go back on his promises. Four, God's character demands absolute faithfulness to his promises. God's character demands absolute faithfulness to his promises. Five, we are to await his perfect timing in all things. We are to wait his perfect timing in all things. I want to do something a little bit this evening. Turn with me, turn with me. Let's read together one passage. You can unmute, unmute yourself so you can I can hear your voice too. Unmute yourself and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Shalom, unmute everybody. We're gonna read together one verse. I'm on it, sir. Hebrews 10, verse 35. 
Some of them don't have audio. But That's fine. Those who have, we can hear them. Hebrews 10, 35. Let us read together. Therefore, Let's read again. Yeah. May the Lord be with you. Father God, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you, for this. thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for you have a plan that cannot be altered. Thank you for your children that you have gathered. Thank you that you have a plan that you have set forth in motion. We know that this plan will be fulfilled, not because of who we are, but because of who and what you are. We rejoice. We dance around the record of your promises, knowing that they will come to pass. No matter the circumstances, no matter what we face in this life, you will bring to pass the plan that you have set before us. The same way you did it for Abraham. The same way you did it for those who followed Abraham. We have confidence in you. You are a faithful God. And so I pray that you bless those who tuned in. Bless those who tuned in from overseas. Keep them safe. Continue to extend your blessing to all of us. Keep challenging us that, that we may keep loving you. Keep yearning for the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us growing in your grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, keep us safe until we meet again. This is my prayer. In the name of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our Master, our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.